Good morning. Well, this is, uh, what is it, November 15th. Um, still 2020? Yeah, about still. three years of this, so yes. if you're at home, you can stay seated this time. We praise you, Lord, for the love that you give and the time that you spend on this world. Choosing that we choose to live in the instead, 
instead of what the world is doing and all the bitterness and grumminess and hatred even that's in the world, we are called to something different instead. Uh, week two was a sacrifice of praise, and we talked about being an offering, a uh, living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to the Lord, that we give our very best. When we come in to worship Him, it's all to Him. And uh, we, we need to kind of think about sometimes maybe how we're coming into that attitude of worship. Uh, this morning, though, I want to talk about the message of praise. And I want to kind of write in spite of in spite of all the things that are going on, I think this is especially especially relevant today, is all this COVID stuff and the protests and the election, all that kind of stuff. Well, in spite of all of that, what are we supposed to be about? What are we supposed to be doing? So this morning, I'm gonna tell you kind of the full story of the Church of Thessalonica. And this is one of the cities in Macedonia and Greece that Paul and Silas visited after God turned them away at the border going into Asia in chapter 16 of Acts. And Thessalonica held a special place in Paul's heart. Um, you have some on your notes there, here's some just background information. It was the capital of Macedonia. Macedonia, capital of Macedonia. And it's the chief city, had a major harbor, and was at the crossroads of very, two very important roadways. It was established in 315 BC by uh, a king by the name of Cassander. And he named it after his wife, whose name was Thessalonica. Uh, and she was named after this goddess of victory. Uh, so your Nike shoes that have a swoosh on them, uh, that is actually off of that history. It was a, uh, it was a tribute to the Greek god of victory, uh, and it came under early Roman rule, even before Christ. It, it came under early Roman rule about 138 BC. So this tells you that there is over 200 years of Roman rule, but there's a lot of Greek culture and history there in Thessalonica. So it's a weird kind of melting pot of both of those worlds and cultures. It was in 49 AD when Paul and Silas found their way there to Thessalonica. Now, true to Greek custom, there's a temple uh, for a Greek god. It was the Greek god of Dionysus, who was the Greek god of wine. And uh, true to Roman culture, there was also a temple to Caesar. And so the two different cultures would go, and there's probably a lot of uh, people going back and forth between the two uh, temples, but there were two major temple presences, and you're going to hear uh, through Thessalonians, if you, if you read through that, this talk about uh, the cultural background in Thessalonica. So the Greeks, they were a pagan people, uh, given to strange religious cults. Uh, and so they had these cults of Dionysus and, and some other cults, and then you had the Romans who were into philosophical debates, and they had a place for that. Surprisingly, though, in the midst of all this, the two temples was a Jewish synagogue that had occurred there because of some of the scattering of the Jewish people. Uh, and so this is the situation that Paul and Silas walk into. So let's read Acts 17, uh, 1 through 10. And uh, we're just going to listen to this this experience that Paul has there. So Paul and Silas then traveled through the towns of, of Amphipolis and Apollonia and came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As was Paul's custom, he went to the synagogue service and for three Sabbaths in a row, he used the scriptures to reason with the people. He explained the prophecies and proved that the Messiah must suffer and rise from the dead. And he said this, this Jesus I'm telling you about is the Messiah. Some of the Jews who listened were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas. Now listen, along with many God-fearing Greek men and quite a few prominent women. But some of the Jews were jealous, so they gathered some troublemakers from the marketplace to form a mob and start a riot. Does that not sound familiar today? They attacked the home of Jason. Jason must have been one of the new Christian converts. 
And they were searching for Paul and Silas so that they could drag them out into the crowd. But not finding them there, they dragged out Jason and some of the other believers instead and took them before the city council. Paul and Silas have caused trouble all over the world, they shouted. Well, that's, pretty, that's a pretty impressive uh, claim, isn't it? <laughs> not, not just Thessalonica, not just this quadrant of Thessalonica. They have caused trouble all over the world. It says, and now they are here disturbing our city too. And, and Jason has welcomed them into his home. They are all guilty of treason against Caesar, for they profess allegiance to another king they named Jesus. Now the people of the city, as well as the city council, were thrown into turmoil by these reports. So the officials forced Jason and the other believers to post bond so they could get out, and they released them. And that very night, the believers sent Paul and Silas to Berea. And when they arrived there, I love this, when they arrived there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. And you just get a sense that Paul and Silas were like, well, We'll just let the cards fall where they may. We're going to trust God with the, with the outcome. But we have a job to do. And they were going to be diligent about doing that. So they moved from city to city, starting churches. Now, historians tell us a little more of this story. The persecution actually became very severe against all Christian believers in Thessalonica. And it, it's hinted at in the last couple sentences where they actually had to sneak Paul and Silas out of the city for fear of imprisonment or worse. And so they were all kind of in hiding, keeping their heads down. Now one would think that with such sudden and severe persecution that it would have ended or at least limited the impact of the church. In fact, I'm sure that Paul, as he was leaving, I'm sure that Paul was worried constantly about what happened to the new Christians there in Thessalonica. Then when Paul was in Corinth, Timothy, remember Timothy, a young pastor, uh, appointed and, and uh, mentored by Paul. Timothy, Timothy shares with him a startling and, uh, and wondrous account of the Thessalonian church. Now remember, they don't have newspapers, they don't have, uh, they don't have Facebook or social media, they don't have phones, so Paul has not heard much from the church of Thessalonica. He's just been worried about them, not knowing what really happened after he left. But Timothy tells him some incredible news. Uh, overjoyed, Paul immediately set to writing a letter of encouragement. This is where you're gonna hear a little of what's been happening. With all of that as context, here's the first chapter of First Thessalonians. We always thank God for all of you and pray for you constantly. See, I wanted you to hear all the context. I wanted you to hear the passion and then the love that Paul has for this church and the constant concern he's had for them, for their very well-being. So when he says this, he, he means this seriously. We always thank God for all of you and we pray for you constantly. As we pray to our God and Father about you, we think of your faithful work, your loving deeds, and the enduring hope you have because of our Lord Jesus Christ. We know, dear brothers and sisters, that God loves you and has chosen you to be his own people. For when we brought you the good news, it was not only with words, but also with power. For the Holy Spirit gave you full assurance that what we said was true. So you received the message with joy from the Holy Spirit in spite of the severe suffering it brought you. In this way, you imitated both us and the Lord. And as a result, you have become an example to all the believers in Greece throughout both Macedonia and Achaia. Now the word of the Lord is ringing out from you to people everywhere, even beyond Macedonia and Achaia. For wherever we go, we find people telling us about your faith in God. We don't need to tell them about it, for they keep talking about the wonderful welcome you gave us and how you turned away from idols to serve the living and true God. And they speak of how you are looking forward to the coming of God's Son from heaven, Jesus, who God raised from the dead. He is the one who has rescued us from the terrors of the coming judgment. I love this passage. 
it gives such a beautiful snapshot of the church that is truly and genuinely being the church. It's being Christ-like. They're, they're worshiping in spite of the world around them, in spite of the persecution around them. They are worshiping, and it's very organically being shared. They speak very much about, oh, when Paul and Silas were here, uh, they taught us this, and they taught us this, and you need to read this, and you need to hear this message. It has changed our lives, and they've been sharing it and sharing it. It has gone beyond Thessalonica. It's gone out to the other cities all around them, even beyond Macedonia. That's the good news that Timothy told Paul. Paul, I know you've been worried about him, but you've got to know that in spite of all that happened, all that persecution, man, they've been getting after it. Eugene Peterson, who uh, wrote the Celebration of Discipline, he also wrote the message, he paraphrases some of this and he says, you are the message. You are the message. Before we've even gone out, you have begun, you have become the message. Years ago, I, I just in reading this chapter and, and thinking about what that meant for me, um, and what that meant for others. And this is a time in my life that I wasn't in, in uh, full-time ministry. I was uh, working at the school uh, coaching, and uh, I was singing in this group, and, and, uh, and I thought, in spite of all these things, and the, I didn't at that time have the office with the title pastor at the time, and I was stressing about that because I thought, well, what am I if I'm not a pastor? And God very clearly told me in this chapter of Thessalonians, you don't have to have an office; you are the message. Speak about what God's been doing. Speak highly of Christ. Share. And uh, wrote a song. We're going to sing and we'll have the lyrics up for you. And I just want you to hear it and receive this uh, and be in it with us.
faith and faithful Thessalonians, they blessed and ministered to Paul. I can't imagine what it must have been like as a church planter back in that time with such heavy persecution and such different cultures to go into a community, set up a church, share that gospel message and disciple them to a point where they could continue and then to move on. So when you read his letters and it says, I've been praying for you, you know he's just been on his knees asking the Lord, would you just protect them? Would you bless them? Would you just grace them with your presence? Holy Spirit, would you just continue this work of the message within them and, and uh, guide them? So I, I, I believe it was a huge blessing and ministry to Paul, just as it is for us today. They were not believers only when convenient. I think it's on your note sheet. They were not believers only when you're convenient. They were believers in spite of all the hardships and struggles. That's a sacrifice of praise. Now listen to how Paul talks about, he, as he recognizes this kinship of mission in his own life. In, in chapter 2 of Thessalonians, uh, 2 through 4, it says this. You know how badly we had been treated at Philippi just before we came to you and how much we suffered there. Yet our God gave us the courage to declare his good news to you boldly in spite of great opposition. So you can see we were not preaching with any deceit or impure motives or trickery. And then I underlined this in mind, for we speak as messengers approved by God to be entrusted with the good news. Our purpose is to please God. Did you hear that? Our purpose is to please or bless God, to give thanksgiving. Our, that's our purpose in life is to live our lives in such a way that we are a blessing, that we are pleasing to God, not people, not the world around us. He alone examines the motives of our heart. So we speak as messengers. And on top of that, we are the message. It's our story and our walk with Jesus that brings tangibility to the good news. And tangibility, something that gives it structure, something that gives it substance, something that makes it real to the people around us. That's what our story does. We can hand them the Bible and they can read that and the Spirit can do amazing things through that. But when they see the words of the, of the Word of God actually played out in somebody's life and they hear somebody say, wow, I began to trust this. I began to live my life accordingly and God has blessed me and God has, has uh, just changed all kinds of things. And so I, I want you to think about all these things that are part of your message. And I'm going to read just a list of them. These are generic. Your message is maybe part of these. Maybe this would be a headline for you, but then you have something unique to share. So maybe you would share that Jesus changed me. I was once this person, but now I'm this person. See, Paul knows that because he was once Saul, and Saul was a far different person than Paul is had a far different mission in life than Paul did. And, and I know many of us have that story of we used to be this way, but now God has done this great work and now we're this way. Or maybe you would say that Jesus healed me. And Jesus heals us in so many different ways. It may have been a physical healing. It may be a mental healing. It may be an emotional. It may be all kinds of things. It may be a spiritual healing. Or maybe you would sit there and say, I thought I had messed up so bad in my life that there was no coming back. For you would say in your testimony, Jesus forgave me. Jesus received my apology, my repentance, and he forgave me. Or maybe you just had a, a path in your life where you've walked a lot of different roads and uh, some of them have been way outside of the grace of God. You turned around and you realized Jesus never left you, that Jesus faithfully stayed with me all through it all. 
Or maybe you've just been hurt hard, um, the death of a spouse or uh, just a major upheaval in your life and, and, and you've just been hurt. And you can say, Jesus is the one who comforted me when nothing else seemed to work. Jesus comforted me. Uh, maybe you could say that Jesus restored me. Jesus brought me back to this place where I should have been all along, but I got out of focus. I, I got out of, out of whack. But I turned back to the Lord and he said, let's get you back where you're supposed to be. And Jesus restored me. And maybe somebody would just say, you know what? I don't think I'd be living here today. Not the way I was living, but Jesus saved me. And he didn't just save me for today, he saved me forevermore. So maybe Jesus saved me, saved my life. Maybe you'd say, Jesus saved my marriage. It was falling apart. We were going different directions. I thought we were done. But we both turned back to Jesus. And he met us at the cross. And Jesus saved our marriage. Maybe you've been in this storm and it's been raging around you. And you thought you were going down. But Jesus brought you peace in the middle of the storm. Somewhere in there, maybe you found your story header. People need to hear your story. It gives tangibility to the good news. So what's your story? If I could give you homework, it would just be this. Take some time, write a paragraph or two about what God is doing in your life. It could be something that was the big turnaround in your life. It could be about this year, this week. It could be anything. But I want you to begin to trust that God is going to use your story to encourage others, to bring them to this place of faith. So what's your story? I'm gonna pray and then uh, sing this last song. So if you just pray with me. Heavenly Father, let us not ever become numb to all that you've done in our lives, to take it for granted, to think that uh, we just needed you for a little part of our life, but we can take over now. Things are going better. Oh Lord, may we actually just, just constantly be aware that we desperately need you. You have done great work in our life. You have done the impossible. You have done miraculous things in our life. I just pray that we just don't lose sight of that. And more than that, Lord, that we would be quick to tell others just how much you can do. Because there's a hurting world around us. We have friends and family who just need to hear those encouraging words. We have neighbors who maybe have never heard this real side of Christianity. They've just only known the religious side. But to hear and see people truly impacted, truly <laughs> swept away by what you're doing in our lives, Lord. So may we just be the message. May we be the message in our houses, in our homes, for our children and for each other. May we be the message in places we work, where we go to school. May we be the message in our neighborhoods, in our community. Wherever we go, Lord, may we be conscious of the fact that you are with us. Therefore, there's an opportunity that someone might meet you through us. So we become bridges. So Lord, give us that opportunity. Lord, as we uh, worship you this morning, we just want you to be raised up.
with you this week and keep up uh, to date with us on, on Facebook. We'll let you know what's going on next Sunday. God bless you.